Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, both in person and to those watching virtually from home. I'm Allison Schilling, the Manager of Public Programs here at the Concord Museum. I'll start by saying that the Concord Museum acknowledges that we are on the land today of the original homelands of the Mashapee Wampanoag, Algonquin Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts Tribal Nations. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land. Larry Spotted Crowman is an award-winning performer, educator, and poet, and a citizen of the Nipmuc Tribal Nation of Massachusetts. We are thrilled that he is sharing his music, culture, and the history of the Nipmuc people in this special program. Thank you for joining us and for welcoming Larry Spotted Crowman. Thank you all for having me, and uh, hopefully everybody can hear me today. I'm not good at shouting, so hopefully everybody back there can hear me. Um, it is a uh, privilege to be with all of you here today on this chilly Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you for um, spending your time. Hope you stay warm. Um, thank you, uh, Concord Museum, for having me, Allison, for bringing me here today. And um, so um, with that, I. Uh, I just want to again express my gratitude for um, being able to share here on the ancestral land of my uh, ancestors, the Nipmunk people. As uh, she mentioned, I am from the Nipmunk tribe. I'm a culture educator, writer, uh, performer. Uh, I have been doing this kind of work for about 30 years. Um, so it's always um, just as equally exciting as the, from the first time I did this uh, three decades ago as, as it is today to share this important work. Um, I'm also the director of the Oki Tail Cultural Center out in Western Mass, Ashfield. Um, one of the most important things I want to say uh, going forward is that uh, folks want to know um, <clears throat> how they can get involved and support these, this, this work and allyship and, accomplish, uh, and being a good accomplice and so on. Uh, so I encourage everybody to look up uh, okitail.org uh, um, and uh, you can always go to the website, uh, Concord, they'll have my information up. If you want to find out how you can get involved and support uh, Okitail, our cultural center, which is uh, a center to uplift all the indigenous people of the Nipmunk uh, area in Western and Central Mass, uh, very important work that we're trying to do out there. And so uh, please uh, get involved and join us in that. And I'll have my Gatorade here. Everybody good? Nice and chilly? I think I see some familiar faces out there. Um, so now that I share that, the second most important, probably the, even the more most important, is that um, I want to um, acknowledge this land in the original language. The language that this grass here that's growing, the trees that are up high in the sky, the water, the animals, the language that they first heard, uh, the language that has been on this land for thousands of years. And so we say in our Algonquin Nipmunk language, we say, Wun nasha natumo manatu, tabatni, wutu chikinisin, okumis. Tabani, which he's supposed to. Wasuka tie huona. Notas niruan menantionk. Kin nota yu pentaminok. And a mayo niruan me quantam kichia. Ka mata wanantam. Ka negutie kukuta niruan. Manatu. Wasuka tie huona. Womaneta tiu. Ka nosoko muso amoke. Nina ho can cantu cho kesich. Niayo. Ni wichia yem no hog nenawa. I greet you in the Algonquin words, the Nipmuc words of peace, of reciprocity, the words that can bring us together in a way that our ancestors envisioned. In these words, I share that I ask all of us to bring your ancestors in as well, that we can exchange in a good way. Because this sharing, the drum I have here and the rattle that I will be sharing is about, um, it's interrelated. It's um, an interrelationship, whereas it's not just transactional, it's an exchange. So as I share, it's a sharing back. So we are connected in that way. When we share in one way, it's, it's kind of just going in and nothing coming out. And so we need to remember that it's a back and forth. Just like when we think about the trees and the water, even that plane going up over the sky, we have to give to receive, right? And so it's very important to remember that foundation. Um, and so, uh, as we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, um, again, it's, um, it's a true honor. I'm in my 50s now, and uh, I started this work a while back, as I said. And, um, and uh, for all those uh, young warriors out there and, and people out there fighting, and uh, I, I still um, 
and very uh, pleased to see the outcomes that are happening today, despite some of the insanity, right, that we're still going through, the, bl the blatant racism and, and the issues that we see, like, right in our face today. Um, uh, still as a child, uh, going to school here, uh, it, it was a very difficult time because they told us, they told me that the Indians were gone and my people were gone. And, and so I had to listen to this right in my class. Uh, uh, things that, you know, and, and it really had deleterious effects on indigenous people and it continues to have that today. And so I honestly never thought it would even be this far as a kid. We're hearing about how Columbus discovered this land and the, the implicit and explicit racism in that statement, whereas the lack of acknowledgement that there were already human beings here to say that he discovered anything, never mind the, the atrocity, just thinking about the explicit racism in that statement, whereas there are already people here, don't they count? And they did it. And that's the kind of message that I grew up hearing. And so thinking about where we are, have come from just in my uh, generation, and, uh, and then thinking about my mom's and her childhood, uh, interracial marriage was still illegal in some states. And then her father's oldest brother was the last child of my uh, families to be taken and put into a boarding school at the age of 13 and didn't see his siblings to, to uh, 18. And so, and then prior generations to that being taken away and re removed from their families. And so we are moving in a good direction, I, I, I say. So I am optimistic despite the hardships and I encourage all those out there fighting for social justice uh, uh, to keep, keep up that work. And as you see, as a culture educator and a, and a, and a, and a teacher, I spent many years uh, uh, doing that work. It's hard for me to not <laughs> to take off that hat. So I get talking and I want to share these important messages before I even begin to sing. And so with that, I'm going to sing. Don't, I'm getting to it. Don't worry. Hang in there. Hang in there. But um, before, <laughs> before I do that, I, I really need to say this, though, is that um, this pandemic, it's really got me all like, uh, you know, really on edge too, and as, as many of you are feeling the same way. And uh, so as I, as, when I begin to sing this song, I wanna send that healing out to everybody. And um, just before the pandemic hit, I was, uh, I was actually speaking, uh, I was in Ecuador, spent about um, a month and a half there, and uh, I was touring down there, and I was at the University of Cuenca, sharing with some elders there, and it was just a phenomenal experience down there. And um, after Ecuador, we were going to head to uh, Australia, but of course, uh, you know, I don't know when, when that's going to happen now. And you know, things are just really crazy with the with the pandemic. Um, the Nipmuc community, we've had a very hard time. We've lost about about seven people already uh, to this pandemic, um, and one person who's who's died. It wasn't uh, COVID, but he had passed during this time, which made it more difficult to to honor him. Uh, my cousin, which I, I I'm not allowed to say his name. Um, in our in our culture, but uh, he's a very dear person to me, and uh, he was our language teacher. So, um, as I share this first song, it's a Nipmo healing song, and I and I remember the words of my my grandfather about this drum, and this sound is uh, as you may have heard many times, it's a heartbeat. So what does that mean? Is it just a cool thing to say? Well, it is a cool thing to say, but it goes further than that. Because he told me long ago is that when we think about the two-legged, our, our, our human beings, we look at each other and we see that some of us uh, on the outside, we may have a different skin tone. We may not be the same gender. Our hair is different. Some people have no hair. I wasn't looking at you. <laughs> but on the inside, everybody is doing this because we all have a heartbeat. And when you look at a two-legged and you just see that they have a heartbeat just like you, all that other stuff just washes away. All that stuff about, well, they don't look like me or, or they don't speak my same language, but they do because this is the language our hearts are all speaking right here. And when we connect on this level, it has a fundamental shift in the understanding. And this is not just for our two-legged human beings. It's for the plants that we see, this grass, the trees, because they're vibrating right now and they're speaking to us. And they want to help us. They want to heal us. And we have to listen to them. The air wants to give us breath. The water wants to nourish us. But if we continue to destroy it, 
it's not going to be able to help us the way it was meant to. So I want to share this Nitmo Keeling song to start us off. Nobody's freezing yet. So I think I'm going to. Yeah, so that, that song, uh, Nipmuc Healing Song, the words are uh, in Nipmuc and uh, it talks about um, bringing peace back to the human beings, uh, term Ninawak. Um, so just a little Nipmuc history. Uh, the term Nipmuc means people of the fresh water. And uh, our homeland comprised about 2,000 square miles. Concord here is on the edge of our homeland here. It's a uh, part of it as well as well as the Massachusetts people. Um, then it goes all the way back to the Connecticut River. Then we go down into northeastern Connecticut, northern Rhode Island, and then all the way back up to the tip of uh, southern New Hampshire. And in, within that area, uh, we had over 32 different villages, or, and, and even more so going back before uh, contact of uh, uh, Nipmuc uh, communities, or I guess the term tribes is, is, is works as well. 
Um, but we didn't necessarily call ourselves Nipmunk. We called ourselves Ninawak, human beings. And, um, and we further identified ourselves from our particular village. For example, Hassanamisset, uh, Wabakwasset, Chibanagungamog, Quaybog, Wamasset, Natick. And so these are the villages that we are usually identified ourselves with at that time. And one of the things that are very significant to our people is, as we talked about earlier, as I mentioned earlier, the water. Um, adult ADD, sorry, get distracted. So the water, the rivers, the, the Merrimack, the Connecticut, the Blackstone, French River, uh, the Quaybog River, and, and many other, all these different rivers were our, our, our uh, roadways, and much like these cars are going here, and it was our way of travel, our communication, trade, sharing, and so on. So we had many songs that we would share as we would be in our machine, which is our word for a canoe. Um, so we had these paddle songs, and this is an example of one here. Yahweh, 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 na. Yahweh, 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 na. We ya na, we ha ha na, we ha na. Ha ya na, we ha ha na, we ha na. We ya na, we ha ha ya, we ha na. Ha ya na, we ha ya, we ha na. Thank you. I should have had some of my ginger tea with me. That would have been good. So, um, the significance of these songs and uh, what you just heard there, as I said, it was a paddle song, but it's also um, uh, very um, significant to this eastern area, as we were referred to sometimes as the Eastern Woodland Tribes. And uh, we had uh, specific, specific uh, styles of music. And uh, we would use also the water drum, which I, I have over there, but we won't have time for that today. Um, and we had the hand drum. We also used the rattles. And we would share these songs, what we call the longhouse um, and, and, we, and longhouse songs. And because uh, the tribal people here did not live in teepees. Do I have to say that again? So we didn't live in teepees. We lived in longhouses and weetus, and they were dome-shaped structures or oblong-shaped longhouses, as they're, you know, pro uh, appropriately called. And, um, and in those lodges, we would share many songs and families would share and, and different things and council would be held and uh, it was a place of community and uh, 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 just kind of uh, living our lives, our day-to-day -day lives would be shared in these longhouses or more specifically, more separate, the, the Weetus as well. 
And so there are many different types of songs, and I'll share a few more here. This is um this is a duck duck dance song, and uh, unfortunately, because of what you know the pandemic, that we can't um, get out here and I can demonstrate the different styles of dances, and because that requires holding hands and and really getting close to these people, and unfortunately, we can't do that. But I really pray in my heart we get to that place once again in the future. But this is a duck dance song. Okay, I was gonna say, yeah, those aren't um, Logan-style airplanes. Those are little props. You know what I'm noticing here too is that when it gets really quiet and I'm singing, it kind of echoes off the trees and the land, and we really get to reclaim this space in those brief moments. And those are the moments that we really have to like remind ourselves of where we are and on this land, and that, and that the voices are. Of this land really in, are feeling that are really like embracing that and i could sense that in those quiet moments where it's just this music this ancient songs that are uh, resonating across this this area that now called concord another song here Actually, an alligator song. I'll explain that. I'll explain that after I do this. I'm looking for that call. Yo, 
So this alligator song, thank you, was actually a gift from the uh, Tuscarora people who became part of the Six Nations. And they were one time in the southern uh, region of uh, East, and of course we know there's alligators down there. So they brought this song up with them and now we share it up here. And so many of us have maybe never seen an alligator, but we could sure sing that song. And I was actually down there and I've had some um, alligator bites. Anybody's ever eaten alligator? Do you like it? Tastes like chicken, right? Everything tastes like chicken. Kind of taste, well, I would say it tastes like the gizzards of chicken, right? Yeah. Alligator meat, good stuff. All right, we're gonna go back to the drum. Watching our time here. All right, and maybe I'll answer a few questions. Hands. All right, we're gonna do a, we call a, Powwow style song. <laughs> Back uh, many years ago, me and my boys, they're all grown now. We used to be known as the Quabbin Lake Singers and we travel around on the, on the Powwow Trail singing a lot of different songs and from all over the US and Canada. And we'd have the big drum and we'd all sit around it and it's a uh, real, real good medicine to, to share that in that way. And I'll talk a little bit about that after the song. So, uh, Here's some of the songs that we would share. So every, everywhere I go and um, sing uh, on the drum, and there'll always be somebody who will, who will ask me, well, what does that way ya, way ya mean? And, um, and sometimes they'll try to come and tell me what they, they figured it out, and they'll come with some papers, and I kind of decipher what you were saying. And, uh, and I'll just smile, and then I'll explain to them. But I'll first ask them, ask them this question. I said, okay, before I answer that, what it means is that I want to ask you a question. I want you to tell me what something means first. There's this very old song that you sing here in this country, and we're almost getting to that time of year where you're gonna be singing it again. But for the life of me, at 53 years old, I still don't know what those words mean. Now, if you, if you could tell me what these words mean, I will tell you what, I, what, I, what that words mean. And the song goes like this. Some of you might have heard this before. Wait for it. It goes like this. Tis the seasons to be jolly. Fa la 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 la. And it goes on. I said, can you tell me what la 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 means? Please tell me. I'm dying to know. We don't know. Nobody knows. I've, I've traveled far and wide. <laughs> okay, but so. Um, native music has uh, different styles to it and different 
and different um, different songs from different communities. Um, it's a very important thing to know that all Native music is not the same. There's about a thousand tribal people from Canada to, to Chile, um, and we all have different unique styles of music and, and, and language and so on. But these songs that you hear, the, the, as it sometimes referred to as chanting as well, these are old songs that the words are gone and they become like medicine songs and chants, whereas the words are not more important as what the feeling is. Um, and so many of us have heard like really so, uh, good songs that we don't know the words and we just start humming it. And after many, many eons have passed, that's what happened to a lot of these songs. They become chants because the words are gone. And it's about that vibration. It's about the, how it resonates in your spirit. Um, my latest book, Drumming and Dreaming, kind of t gets into that. Um, I don't have too much time to go into it here, but uh, Drumming and Dreaming is uh, essentially has a lot to do with the spiritual concepts of our Nipmung people uh, in terms of uh, connecting to the spirit world and visions. So the drum connects to the dream and the dream connects to the drum and it takes you to these very uh, uh, different spaces, right, of, of connection and, and being. And a lot of that has to do with um, uh, how our relationship has, has grown through time on this land. And so the drum carries that significant meaning as uh, the oldest instrument throughout the planet. And uh, my cousin Hawk, who's a flutist, he would say the flute is. But then we would both agree the human voice is the first instrument. So you got the voice, the flute, and the drum are some of the oldest instruments on the planet. And, um, and so they, and they carry a deep significance. Um, so having said that, I'm going to, I'll do some questions in a little bit. I want to share another style of song. And um, one of the great things about uh, uh, our, our, you know, native people today is that we do have this pan-Indianism in, in, in a sense where we're able to share different music and, and travel through different places. So uh, through the years, I was able to learn some songs in different languages, including Cree and Navajo, much like people speak uh, English and Spanish and French and and so our, in our native communities we do similar things as that is uh, we could speak different languages some Cree and Ojibwe and so on and so this next song is actually in a Navajo language and um, and it's um it's important to make that distinction because as I said um, some people hear a native music for the first time they think it all sounds the same it's all from one tribe and I assure you it's not and so this is a uh, uh, again, it's in the Diné language, uh, Navajo language, this song here. <clears throat> you may notice the difference. Hey, 
Questions? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. The Navajo song? So, um, I forget the writer's name off the top of my head, but that was one of the grand entry songs for the Gathering of the Nations about 15 years ago. And this uh, Navajo uh, musician, he actually wrote that song as a lullaby for his daughter. So the words are about putting a little girl to sleep. It's a, it's a, actually a lullaby song. Yes. Yes, it is. So I wouldn't be. Uh, so um, I actually have one over there, and I wish I had more time to get into that. But um, so it's um, it's a, the, you have a log you you would get from a tree after you say some prayers in the ceremony, and uh, it'll be about this big, the drum, and uh, it's carved out. And then there's a little hole in the side to plug it up and you'll put some water in it and, and put a hide over top and you'll be able to sing. That was actually the original drums that we've had from this area, the water drum. Next time we'll do the water drum, we'll bring that. Yes. The population. Yes, that's a, I, I love this question because um, uh, we, re, we don't, nobody knows. Um, and uh, but our estimates are upwards of millions of people uh, in terms of just our community alone. Um, the reason why I say nobody knows is because uh, the more information we continue to find about what happened here, the more we keep unveiling uh, a larger extent of, of everything in terms of how long people been here, uh, how, how many uh, people lived here, um, the distribution of languages, uh, the intellectual pursuits. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we, we've learned is that uh, language helps us understand this. Uh, for example, we speak the Algonquin language here, and uh, all the way to the West Coast in Alberta, we have people, uh, the Cree people, the Soto Cree, uh, are speaking the similar language. So language distribution helps us understand the amount of time. And so looking at language, we know that people have been here a lot longer than 15 to even 20,000 years, uh, years ago. Um, now we're finding out, now they're discovering, they just made a discovery that they, they see inhabitants been here 30,000 years. Uh, and it's going to keep growing because um, uh, in our traditional stories, we have told we have always been here. Um, so population, it's a, it's a tricky question. And um, one of the things that the, uh, including Columbus and the, the people uh, that came on the Mayflower and Cabot and so on, uh, by by not talking about the, the level of genocide that was taking place kind of, in a sense, diminishes the, uh, the effects in terms of not wanting to have this, uh, this overly bearing bloody history to talk about. Um, but what we do know is that even if we said uh, the population in North America alone, which is a number that a lot of people fall on, is between 18 to 20 million people. Um, and so by the time of uh, the 1900s, the Native American population U.S., the census that was taken was 237,000 people. That's a 96% genocide rate. Uh, the largest genocide rate of anywhere, anytime on the planet has occurred right here. Um, so, I mean, I can go on and on about that, but so the, the population numbers are, are going to vary. Uh, any more? Uh, yes, sir. Several major Uh, as I said, so the way of travel for all of our ancestors were the rivers. So every river would have its own significance to that particular community. Uh, for example, you know, uh, the, the French and the Blackstone and the, the Quinnebog rivers, all these rivers uh, eventually tied in all these different communities. And so without looking at the history and digging into every uh, 
that specific area, I'm sure we would find very um, some significant details that were, you know, supporting the life of the people who are here. Um, for example, in my town, uh, uh, it's kind of funny, you know, I, I live in Webster, but as we call Webster, um, it's a very significant town to our, our, our people. Um, and they've just finished creating the um, Samuel Slater Museum, who was the founder of the area. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, they want our voice in, in, involved in that and so on. But one of the things that Samuel Slater was responsible for is building that mill in, in, uh, in the, at, uh, at the Cranston Mill and some other things there that are essentially decimated the rivers there and destroyed our way of life. So now it's not only our food that's being destroyed, it's our ceremony because um, we had a ceremony where we welcomed the eel, we welcomed the salmon, we welcomed the, the, the sucker fish and, and the different androgynous fish that androgynous fish that traveled. So it was ceremony around these foods that were traveling and so you, you essentially disrupt the way, uh, a way of life as well. Yes. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And I, that kind of opened up. I kind of alluded to that when I was opening up because uh, we're seeing so many young um, honoring their traditions but at the same time um, getting involved in their, uh, in their academia. And so they're really bringing these two together, and I'm really uh, uh, proud of that. And so much like the work we're doing with the Oki Teo Cultural Center, it's a place-based educational center, uh, like, as we like to call it, uh, where they can explore STEM uh, and also their cultural pursuits as well and creativity and art. Um, and so it's a really great place that we have there for, for our youth to, to do all these things, as opposed to, <laughs> I go back to my child when these things weren't available, so now I'm really seeing that. Yes. Yes, it is. It is an old name, but the meaning, uh, the, the meaning has been said, you fish on your side, I fish on my side, nobody fishes in the middle. The real meaning is that each of us have our boundaries and the center is for the creator. And um, the lake is actually a sacred lake of our, of our ancestors where our, it is believed that the, the great spirit Manitou dwells in the center. And um, when our ancestors pass, they will sometimes dwell in this area. And so it was kept sacred. And even today, um, uh, Webster Lake is a big draw. It's a big tourist tourist attraction and uh, anybody who comes there they you know whether you're native or not you find the, the you really admire being on that water people just love it and it has that appeal to it that spiritual appeal yes <laughs> ah okay so it's uh Kentantuet, or you could say Manitou uh, and so um, Manitou is, uh, um, a, it's more of the term where what's, what's inert, what's inside. It's uh, like everything has Manitou, like uh, the grass. But Kintantu was being more specific to that, to that energy field, which is really not, um, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, Christianity, for example, where, uh, you know, you have spirits that are kind of like um, anthropomorphized, into pe beings, we're really not seeing Kentantua as a, as a being. It's a, it's a more of an energy, and more of a power that's all around, encompassing everything. And so when people says, uh, "Well, what is God?" They say, "We don't know." And so sometimes we'll say the great mystery in our language as well. And so we don't really, because we believe once you try, it, once you define it, it disappears. And and what's really fascinating when you think about the way our elders were talking, it's like a, um, it's like when you look at a. a, a, a what is that now? Um, positive, uh, um, a neutron. And if you look at it, it's, is it an energy or is it a wave? How's that go? Anybody know that? Familiar with that? And so it was this, kind of the same concept with the spirituality. And you know, you look, at, you get into quantum physics, you start, you see how they really intersect with indi indigenous spirituality. Fire. We would have fires in there, keep them warm. And uh, they will be very um, ingeniously made where uh, there'll be a little pit in the bottom of the fire and a, and a smoke hole at the top. And so you wouldn't get smoked out and suffer from you know, <laughs> carbon monoxide. And so they were very smart about creating these fire pits inside their lodges. And so that would, that would be how you keep warm. So, um, right, so again, how we relate to our environment is very uh, 
it, it's a really um, significant way. Uh, so the swamps were places where the powwows would go. And powwow is not this festival word that we use today. The powwow was really meant for a medicine person. So the powwows would go to these swamps and cedar, cedar areas because they believe that's where the medicine dwelt in a powerful way. And they would go to these places and, and have ceremony. Um, and so in, in talking about that, we should mention that um, uh, here, here on Indigenous Peoples Day, it wasn't until 1978 that Native American people could legally drum and sing and do things without reprisals or, or out breaking a law or feel some, fear um, some kind of uh, uh, reprisal, physically or, 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 or illegally. Uh, and so 1978, that's within my lifetime. And, and it's really jarring to think about that. We just got our right to, to ceremony uh, not too long ago. Yes, the last time I was here, I had it on. <laughs> so we, um, uh, and that's a good question because right now we're coming up on uh, Halloween and a lot of, you know, so the word appropriation, exploitation really uh, comes up a lot in our communities because um, when people put on a Halloween costume and dress up as an Indian, it's, uh, it's disparaging um, and it really uh, takes away from the cultural reverence and the spirituality and, 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 uh, and the respect that we have uh, when you can go to Kmart or Walmart and, and buy these uh, plastic leather outfits and put them on and, and, and play Indian and run around like a crazy person and, and say, oh, I'm an Indian now. And then so, and you can see the problem with that, the way I laid it out. And so this is what we're trying to get away from and, and build a more healthier respect, a more, re a reci uh, more reciprocity in terms of uh, cultures and, and understanding of each other. And that's kind of what, why I'm here today and the work that I do, the work that we do at Oki Teo. Um, because we also recognize a lot of people still don't understand that, uh, whether it's the, the putting on a, the costume or, or, um, or the mascot issue which is a big issue that we're really trying to address. This is um, a, what we call a round dance. And uh, usually at this part of the program, I'd have everybody join in a circle and we would sing and hold hands. But so just kind of envision that. <laughs> song is uh, in honor of uh, Kankantu. Anybody know what that means, Kankantu? Who knows? That's the ah! crow. Oh, hey. 
for you, different style. This is more of a, as I said, uh, those words that don't have, uh, the songs that don't have words, this is one here. Good thing that's empty. How are we for time? Oh, we're just about out of time, so um, any more? Usually people have more. Uh, somebody who didn't go yet? Uh, right here. Oh, oh you, you, sir? Yeah. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> Oh, it's it's more of an emphasis that uh, you're 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 um, completing something and just kind of a yeah, kind of underscoring the the emphasis of the music. Yeah. Yes. My name. Oh, oh boy, that's a long one. That's a long conversation. But my name was gifted from my my uh, grandfather. It's Kankantu Chokeseche. Yes. Yeah. The crow is very uh, the crow and the musk as well. Bear. A very important motifs in the Nipmung Pantheon. Yes. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, among many. Yeah, the bear. Um, and so, I uh, again, if you uh, get a chance to check out some of my books, my latest book, Drumming and Dreaming, it's a book of traditional uh, Nipmung legends, and also um, the Morning Road to Thanksgiving, which is really a good read at this time of year. Um, but uh, going back to my uh, latest book, Drumming and Dreaming, real quick, um, it really highlights our traditional stories, our names of this of this place. As I said earlier, uh, when we think about what happened here, the um, the genocide in the erasure, right? So a lot of things happened. It wasn't just the uh, the genocide; it was the erasure of identity, uh, and we see this um, play out on tribal communities from the from the decimation, uh, whether it's drug, alcohol, health disparities, uh, depression. Uh, poor housing uh, and, and so on um, and a lot of that has to do with the stories that were lost the identity of self taken away because our skies became Greek our land became English and our hearts became empty uh, 
when we look at what we call now the Big Dipper, to us that's Sky Bear, which is in my story. And when we see these different rivers, you know, they're, they're named in our language. And so when we can identify our language in, in the sky, the cosmology, and the, the terrain, and then we begin to reflect ourselves back. But if we reflect ourselves back and see nothing, and then we end up treating ourselves like nothing. And this is why we have the calamity that we have across uh, indigenous communities where the idea of self, the idea of self-actualization and being who they are was, was stripped away. Um, the boarding schools were, were, were the weapon, was the weapon that used that, where my ancestors suffers and countless other children, where uh, the trope was kill the Indian to save the man. And so I told you that was a big question. <laughs> so yes. Um, any last thoughts? Um, as I said, it's been about 30 years now. I think it's like with any other discipline practice, listen. Very important to listen to the people who know uh, and just keep learning, keep, uh, keep remain teachable. Um, and so that would be the idea behind that. With, it, with any discipline, uh, put the effort into it and, uh, you know, continue to learn and push yourself where you can. And, um, you know, I, as a traditional storyteller, sometimes I'll, um, because, uh, again, it's important to note that uh, all tribes are not the same and not all Indian people are the same. Not every native person you're going to meet is going to be a singer, a crafter, a drummer, uh, a carver. And sometimes we get, you know, in these stereotypes, we get lost in that, right? And so some of my cousins who are not storytellers, they will say to me, how can you remember all these stories? I say, well, I'm, I'm kind of old, so it doesn't happen on its own. It's practice, practice, practice. And sometimes I tell the stories to myself to remember. And, and, I, and I recite them. It just takes that dedication to anything you want to be good at, right? And so that's, that's what you got to put into it. It takes that work. And so with that, I'll just close out with another uh, Longhouse song. Thank you. And by the way, that that last song was the mosquito song to push the mosquitoes away. And see, it worked. <laughs> so um, with that, uh, I guess we're out of time. You guys can go get warm now. Uh, I really appreciate uh, everybody coming out, uh, uh, listening, and uh, I thank you. And unfortunately, I don't, I can't do the the chat afterwards. So I, I appreciate that. Nobody not coming up too close because, uh, as I said, this Corona gives me the heebie-jeebies. So we all got to keep each other safe. So unfortunately, we can't do that hangout time afterwards. So uh, again, I want to thank everybody for coming out. And please, um, thank you. Yes. <laughs>